Nos anos 50, você não brincava com trens porque queria mudar o mundo. Era um hobby tranquilo para pintar carrinhos e posicionar árvores. Até que alguém viu nos trens de brinquedo o que eles realmente eram. Uma rede. Estudantes de ciência da computação entediados começaram um clube de ferro modelismo que mudou tudo. O grupo invadiu os servidores da faculdade, soldaram linhas telefônicas para controlar os trens independentemente. Onde muitos viam um hobby chato, eles viram o potencial de tirar todo o sistema dos trilhos. Eles até criaram um dicionário para definir o que faziam, aplicando a criatividade para gerar resultados inteligentes, ou como eles chamavam, hackear. E assim surgiram os primeiros hackers de computador. Os anos se passaram e os hackers encontraram um lar no computador pessoal. Lá, eles redescobriram o que conheciam melhor, redes. Nada havia mudado. Eles ainda estavam testando o que o brinquedo podia fazer, só que agora as redes eram essenciais para nossas vidas. Bancos, transporte, agricultura, governos. De repente, os hackers tinham poder para descarrilhar muito mais que trens de brinquedo. Alguns usaram esse poder para ganho próprio. Estados com alto financiamento foram à guerra. Gangues criminosas roubaram milhões. Então eles foram atrás das pessoas. Os dados de bilhões de usuários que usam a internet no dia a dia. Quem poderia pará-los? Os únicos que entendiam a internet tão bem quanto. Os hackers. Aqueles que quebravam o sistema para torná-lo mais seguro. Aqueles que viam o que o sistema realmente era. Uma rede a ser protegida. Quando seu trabalho é manter bilhões de pessoas seguras online, você precisa respirar a internet, assim como os invasores. Porque a única maneira de parar um hacker é pensando como um. Heather já teve praticamente todos os cargos de segurança no Google, liderando equipes na linha de frente de todo o grande ataque contra a empresa e os usuários. Se você ouviu falar, ela lutou contra. E se você não ouviu falar, agradeça a ela também. Então, quando você quer saber sobre o maior ataque da história do Google, não há ninguém melhor para perguntar do que ela. A melhor introdução é a música do verão. Estamos em 2009. Was an exciting time at Google. 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 And Android, Android Street View Nine Directional is cameras. preparing to launch its own operating, operating system. system. Very simple, very intuitive. It just works. Building new and interesting products and building security into those products and the infrastructure. We thought we were doing a pretty good job. So it was a, a shocking moment to have everything sort of stop. December 14th. It was around 4 p.m. Just come out of my last meeting of the day, returned to my desk, and found a, a hive of energy nearby. Everyone standing around a computer sort of talking, and they told me that they'd 
found some very interesting activity. Essa atividade interessante era resultado de uma mensagem enviada para um funcionário do Google. Uma pergunta casual com um link aparentemente inocente. Em qualquer dia, mais de 5 bilhões de links são acessados em toda a internet. Mas esse link específico mudou o curso da história da segurança cibernética. Ele abriu um site hospedado do outro lado do mundo e começou a baixar software malicioso de forma invisível no computador do funcionário do Google. E assim, eles entraram. Os invasores usaram esse ponto de entrada único. I was contacted by an incident responder and they said, "Hey, um, you know, we think we have something on one of your Windows machines." So, the pull for me into security was one uh, that was kind of cataclysmic, I, I would say, right? But it really struck me as something that, that I wanted to be part of. No momento, a segurança estava longe do cargo de Tinwin. Ele era responsável por manter os sistemas Windows em execução no Google. O que explica por que ele recebeu um chamado sobre uma das machines com ação suspeita. Um, honestly, I was pretty naive. I mean, I thought, you know, okay, one machine was compromised. That sucks, right? My day sucks. But literally by the hour, it got worse. It was a server that was meant for testing. It was tucked away in a corner of a data center. And the attacker had really set up home on that network. We could see right away. I mean, there should not be a breach of this size. That just should be happening. Este é Eric Gross. Ele era o líder da equipe de segurança e privacidade quando tudo aconteceu. We did not have playbooks for how to deal with all this. This wasn't an ordinary security event. The speed, the ability for the attacker to learn on the fly, change their tactics. It was extraordinary. It was different. It was unique. I mean, my world had just changed, right? We dropped everything and focused on this. The following day, I was pinged again. Tim, can you come to the war room? There's a few of us here looking at additional machines. I was like, okay. By the third day, I just went straight to the war room. I didn't even go back to my desk. And that's where I sat for, I think, the next six weeks straight. The investigation started with one dedicated conference room. And that quickly grew into three conference rooms and four conference rooms, and then suddenly a whole building. Pessoas chegavam de avião, trem, carro, qualquer outro meio necessário. Viajando pessoalmente ou ligando todo dia. Especialistas como Mike Sino chegaram de Nova York. I was up at uh, 2:30 that morning to catch the 6 o'clock flight. E o líder de resposta a incidentes cancelou as férias. I was on holiday uh, in New Zealand, so I did some of the work remotely, attempting to do forensics, you know, over dial-up. But pretty soon it became a book the first flight, turn up in Mountain View and, and, and make it happen. I remember landing in San Francisco airport and from that point we were barreling down the highway at like 100 miles an hour and it didn't slow down for weeks afterwards. Uma equipe foi montada com pessoas do mundo todo. A Heather acendeu o sinal. Os Googlers vieram e ela os colocou para trabalhar. It definitely felt like something out of a spy movie. Heather handed me a list of machines and said, go get them. Go pull hard drives out of machines all over campus. And this is in the middle of the night. So we hop in the rental car and we're driving around campus in the dark. We've got a bunch of flashlights running through buildings, capturing machines to do forensics on it. First, we started trying to unscrew and pull the hard drives out, but we decided that was taking too long. So we were just taking the machine. Just unplugging the systems and leaving a post-it note for them. <laughs> security was here. Please call this number. We had a stack of hard drives and a stack of machines in the trunk of the car. By that stage, we had a number of people just kind of churning through, looking at the different systems and figuring out, like, what happened on this machine. Enquanto a equipe investigava 24 horas por dia, Heather deu o alarme para outros do setor. And I got this call from Heather Atkins, who wanted to chat with me about something that they had discovered at Google. Entra Dmitry Alperovitch, diretor da Silverado Policy Accelerator, um gigante global de segurança cibernética. Mas em 2009, ele estava se aperfeiçoando em uma empresa de segurança chamada McAfee, o 
que começou como cortesia profissional se tornou uma parceria, conforme Dimitri e sua equipe arregaçaram as mangas. Aurora. Por que essa palavra se destacou? Bem... Outubro de 1917. Um tiro é disparado de um navio russo que patrulhava o Mar Báltico. O cartucho estava vazio. A mensagem não. Um tiro que iniciaria a Revolução Russa. E mudaria para sempre o curso do século XX. E o nome do navio que fez o disparo? Isso mesmo. A Aurora. When I saw it, I instantaneously knew that I had to name the whole operation Aurora. Porque assim como o navio Aurora fez um disparo que ecoou por décadas. Operation Aurora in cyberspace, I think had a similar effect. The world has changed. We have to change everything about the industry's approach to cybersecurity to deal with this new threat. When you get attacked, it's a bit like playing a game of chess. If your opponent opposite you knows every move you're going to make, it's going to be very easy for them to build counter moves to checkmate. We wanted to keep that element of surprise for as long as possible by studying as much as we can about the attack and then cutting them off instantaneously. A equipe se esforçou muito para manter a investigação em segredo absoluto. We pretty much had to lock down the entire floor. Havia uma lista secreta de quem podia entrar e sair. We would put security guards outside the door, a little bit speakeasy style, you had to kind of know how to get in. Nem a equipe de limpeza podia entrar na sala de guerra. Pizza boxes and empty coffee cups kind of spread throughout the room. It was it was smelly for quite some time. As pessoas pararam de conversar online. Just in case we were being watched. The access controls to the room were tight. We had senior VPs, we had the founders of the company with us. It was, you know, it was tense. As you're building this picture of how the attacker is working, it's a rush of adrenaline because you can start to plot points of how to eradicate them from the network. A equipe apertou o cerco, fez armadilhas e se posicionou para avançar contra o invasor. Só havia um problema. O recesso de fim de ano. We always wonder if the attackers pick the holidays on purpose. They know most people aren't paying attention during the holidays. It wasn't our first Christmas where, you know, something interesting had come up. Antes de investir contra o invasor, a equipe mudou de estratégia. We suddenly decided we wanted to be very radical in our approach. Qual foi essa abordagem? We knew we had to get everyone off the network now. We had to make the biggest change we ever made to our infrastructure, and we had to do it in less than an hour. E quem seria responsável por puxar o gatilho? I, you know, I, I do the short straw, so part of my role was really to cut off everybody from the network. Isso mesmo, todo mundo. Engenheiros do Google, pesquisadores de segurança, até a header yeah. seriam removidos da rede e a senha seria redefinida. I did not make any friends at the company over Christmas. Essa era a única opção de garantir que qualquer vínculo do invasor com o Google fosse erradicado. E com isso, a equipe foi em frente. Sistematicamente removendo o invasor de todos os sistemas de uma vez. O invasor foi banido da rede. Mas ainda havia uma pergunta. Quem estava por trás do ataque? On January 12th of 2010, Google announced it had witnessed a sophisticated and targeted attack. It was shocking. Google was one of the first companies ever that voluntarily disclosed that they've been hacked. And in the investigation of that event, we found that at least 20 other companies were compromised as well. We were able to 
lend some experience that we'd gathered. Not only did they come out and publicly reveal that they'd been hacked, but for the first time, they were able to attribute the attack. In mid-December, we detected a highly sophisticated and targeted attack on our corporate infrastructure. Originating from China, we discovered in our investigation that the accounts of dozens of Gmail users around the world who advocate for human rights in China appear to have been accessed by third parties. Uh, the president is obviously aware of it. As with all intrusions, we employ a, an all-of-government approach with the appropriate agency in the lead. In this case, the FBI is coordinating the response. Now the cyber battle has heated up and may have far-reaching consequences. I didn't used to think that a foreign military would come after us, and now they obviously are. Well, where are the new boundaries? What's internationally accepted legitimate action? It's not a surprise that we would see governments hacking each other. I think it's a little bit of a surprise to us when we saw attacks happening against private companies, against companies that were enabling business online, helping students learn, helping people express themselves. That seemed out of bounds. We view it as our job to stand between these very capable government attackers and individuals who can't possibly be expected to defend against that. We chose to stand in between. We stopped them, but I'm not convinced that they would never try again. So we decided we wanted to start making radical changes, not just rebuilding things the way that we had them before, but we wanted to do things completely different, ways people have never dreamed of before, ways attackers had never dreamed of before, we were going to change the battlefield. I'm realistic that there will be threat actors who want to do the same thing. But if they do try again, I want them to have a very bad day. The primary job of threat analysis is to understand the attacker so we can counter them and we can protect our users from them. Um, we're dark wizard catchers. Government back threats. Ransomware. Phishing messages. It's essentially a field of landmines. Hostile actors are trying to interfere with election. It's not enough to draw a fence around the people that you see on the front page of the newspaper. You have to secure everyone. There are bad actors online who would not like to see democracy succeed.